Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, welcome back to the I Should Totally Be Dead Right Now podcast, where we tell true stories of survivors of true crime, natural disasters, and everything else in between. So, hey Michelle. What's up? How's it going? It's going pretty good. So, this is our... uh, was it like the last wintry type? I don't know. It turns out I think it's more of a an adventuring oh, okay, episode, yeah. if you will, by coincidence. It is by coincidence, <laughs> yes. But it's freaking pouring outside. Yeah, it is. And it's we cold. are drinking delightful rum chata hot chocolates. Yes. Very delicious. Yeah, it turns out rum chata was the missing ingredient of hot chocolate this whole that's time. That's true. And that's what it is. It's just hot chocolate and rum chata. Yeah. There you it's, go delightful we yeah. popped a cinnamon stick in there put a little whipped cream on top a little caramel along the rim yeah mm-hmm. that was fancy fancy and sticky yeah that's delightful. true it was really <laughs> sticky um all right did you have that good... was a large sip I yeah <laughs> did you have a good valentine's day oh yeah that's good pretty low-key yeah mine too watch some movies eat some takeout nice that's all you need that Drink a lot of champagne. <laughs> there you go. I was vaguely concerned I was going to be hungover today. for today. Yeah. Okay. That's good. I'm not though. Nailed yeah. it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, anything else before we just jump on into let's, it? No. Let's just fucking jump in. I like it. All right. So my story is about Beck Weathers. Beck Weathers. That's an interesting name. I know, right? Well, just like the the singer. The yeah, the singer. Beck. Beck. I guess it's just Beck. <laughs> I don't know Beck's last name. Uh, if I he don't has know one. either. All right. So it is May 10th, 1996. Ooh. Okay. And Beck is 49 years old. All right. And a pathologist living in Dallas, Texas. Okay. Okay. He had an obsession for climbing. Like for years. He loved mm. climbing. And it was his quest to complete the seven summits, which is climbing the tallest mountain on each continent. Oh, okay. So I can't come up like going to Mount Fuji right, in Japan right. and going to Mount Everest. So he already completed one, a guided climb of Vinson Massif in Antarctica. Nailed it. I have no okay, idea, but sure. it sounds good. And now Mount Everest was going to be his second. Oh, okay. Yes. So two of seven, if you will. Right. He was going to knock off. Yeah. Um, so he joined a group of eight people to climb Mount Everest. So they began on May 10th. Mm. So Beck's wife was not a fan of his climbing. <laughs> That's hysterical. It, well, it really put a strain on their marriage. And once he came back from this one, she said that their marriage was going to be over. Oh, shit. Like, so it's pretty much it, an ultimatum. Like, yeah, give up mountain climbing forever or I'm walking out the yeah. door mm-hmm. forever. Yep. Mm. He really wanted to do this climb. He's like, fuck it, I'm going anyway. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, so he, he went, he, uh, he met with his crew at a uh, base camp, and there was a wind of negative 21 Fahrenheit. Oh my god, I can't even fathom how cold that is. Yeah, that blew at 157 miles per hour. What the fuck? <laughs> uh, so, is it just freezing your face as much. you're walking? Yeah. I, I can't even crazy i don't have this adventuring spirit i don't have a drive to climb a mountain right. or fucking do anything right. athletic <laughs> or crazy well mount everest is twenty nine thousand and two feet tall oh yeah oh no sorry it's twenty nine thousand twenty nine feet and that was recognized by nepal in china anyways okay so pretty 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 tall yeah fucking taller um, than anything i've seen i think I'm always cold, so I couldn't imagine <laughs> just wanting to be cold for long periods of time. Well, and you have to just be cold the entire time. Yeah. I mean, there can't be a single time that you're warm. Right. It's like camping at its fucking worst. Well, I guess if you're climbing, you're sweating. I don't know. It just sounds yeah, bad so your all around. F- sweat can freeze you. That's that sounds true. awesome. Okay. <laughs> so the group was guided by Rob Hall. He was a veteran mountaineer that uh, have completed the seven summits. So he did it. Oh, He did all of them. And he actually uh, owned his own adventure climbing company. And this would be his sixth 
summit on Everest. Okay, so he's got some experience. Yeah, he was not worried. So he's like, I'm not worried. You guys should not be worried. It's going to be great. Mm. So are you braiding your hair? Sure am. All right. It's bugging the shit out of me. You look like Elsa. That's how I like to roll. Oh, my God. Have you seen that video of that little girl doing the frozen? Oh, in the snow. Oh, my gosh. Were you crying? Well, a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Aw. No, she's just so pleased with herself. Mm -hmm. And... Just learning to be empowered at such a young age. And she rips off her gloves. And I love the walk when she gets all sassy with her walk. That's the best part. Sorry. Super cute. No, it's good. I didn't mean to <laughs> derail us. Um, so when the group set out, the weather was actually clear. So it cleared okay. up. The group was upbeat and what was I going to say? Optimistic. Optimistic. And ready Thank to you. Yeah. Rock and roll. Yeah. They're get ready. to that summit. Yeah. Knock off two of seven. Well, the climb to Everest takes about 12 to 14 hours. Fuck, that annoys me. God. <laughs> Could you imagine me climbing a mountain? No. <laughs> you can do it. No. Well, not, not Everest. No. But a mountain. Maybe. I've heard Mount Fuji's not so bad because there's okay. like way stations along the way oh. that you can like nap and get snacks and okay. stuff. So I'd be down for that. All right. That sounds good. Um, My dad climbed Mount Fuji. Did he? Yeah, he has a stick or had a stick with all the... That's stamps cool. on it and the little Japanese flag. Aww. I know. I think my brother has it. That's cool. Yeah, I thought it was. I used to play with it a lot when I was a kid. Sorry. <laughs> so so, right. so but, he's making his way. Well, before Beck went on this trip, he actually had surgery on his eyes to fix his nearsightedness. Mm. So the doctor made tiny incisions in his corneas to change the shape to make it for better sight. Okay, so is this like LASIK pretty much? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. It's LASIK. But... With the altitude, it warped uh, his recovering eyes. So he was still recovering from the surgery, so the altitude was, like, fucking it all up. Oh, no. That sucks. Yeah. So that made him almost completely blind once it got dark. Like, he couldn't see at all. So Rob, the the leader, Rob, told Beck that he could not continue. Uh, He would take the rest of the group up and then pick him up on the way down. Oh. So Beck was really depressed and would kind of fight him on it but he kind of it made sense he can't see yeah and so he he's just a liability to to the whole rest of the safety of the rest of the team exactly so he agreed and he waited and then um as other groups were passing him they invited him to go with them but he said no i said i would wait for my group that is not what i expected you to say (laughs) he was like hell yeah now's my chance yeah (laughs) no he waited good job um as the rest of the group went up, one member became too weak to continue. So Rob refused to leave them, um, and he stayed with that member. Oh. As he stayed with that member, unfortunately, Rob succumbed to the cold, and he died. <gasps> what? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This is, took a turn. I know. I wasn't <laughs> expecting it. <laughs> so it was 10 hours later that Beck realized something was not right. Something Because they're not gone back wrong. yet. Exactly. Okay. So since being alone, he still had to wait for someone to come down because hmm. he didn't want to go by himself. And so he just waited. Yeah, I imagine that's a death sentence. <laughs> it was okay. a little after 5 p.m. and a climber descended and told Beck that Rob was stuck. He waited for one of his members of the original group to come down. Mike Groom was a fellow team leader with Rob. Mike had scaled Everest before and Mike and the rest of the group set out uh, for their tents to wait until morning to get to the bottom. Mm. So they had a like a little base camp set with their tents. Mm. So while they came down, Mike's like, okay, let's all go find our tents, you know, and regroup and yeah. figure out what the fuck to do. Exactly. Unfortunately, a storm kind of blew in at that time mm. and it was covering the entire area with snow and it was reducing the visibility to zero. So oh my gosh. it was so windy, it was so snowing that they couldn't find, couldn't see anything. Gosh. So oh. they all huddled together and they kind of were like shuffling around trying to find their tents and trying to make their way down. Oh my God. This is not making a case for me mountain climbing <laughs> ever. Beck lost one of his gloves in this process and immediately started to feel the effects of high altitude and freezing temperatures on his hands. Oh gosh. Well, it was probably frostbite immediately <laughs> was setting in. Well, as the team huddled, a huge gust of wind knocked Beck on his back. And Mm. that's kind of where he stayed. 
<gasps> why everyone else was kind of huddled. So, with him being blind from the altitude and his supplemental oxygen depleted, Beck entered into a hypothermic coma. Oh, gosh. Did I say that right? Hypothermic? Yeah, I think so. Hypothermic coma. So, during the night, a Russian guide rescued the team. Like, he set out, he found them, and um, but saw the condition that Beck was in, and he deemed him beyond help. Oh, shit. He's oh, like, he's not going to make... It's too late for him. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. dead. So, they left him. Oh, my gosh. In the morning, a Canadian doctor was sent up to retrieve Beck, and also a woman they left as well, because she was in the same... Same predicament yep. as mm-hmm. Beck was. And the doctor peeled a sheet of ice from her body, which was Yasoko Numba. Hmm. Uh, the doctor peeled a sheet of ice from her body and decided that she was beyond saving. So I had to turn the page. <laughs> so she's still alive and they're just pulling ice off of her? Yeah, they were saying oh that God. they were so they were so close to death, but still barely breathing. Oh, my word. I wonder if they're conscious. Probably not. Well, they were in a coma. Oh yeah, you said that. Yeah. Sorry, you're right. And then the <laughs> so doctor, <no. laughs> and then the doctor said the same thing about Beck, that he was Too beyond far gone. saving. Sorry yeah. About it. So they left him again. Oh my god. <laughs> his face was encrusted with ice. His jacket was open to his waist, and several limbs were stiff. Frostbite was not far from coming. Oh my goodness. Uh, around 4 p.m., Beck woke up from his coma. <laughs> He states, I was so far gone in terms of not being connected to where I was. There was a nice, warm, comfortable sense of being in my bed. It was really not unpleasant. So, That's what I've heard is you right. get so cold that your mm-hmm. body like tells you you're warm and you get cozy and then you just want to sleep and die. Right. Oh. Well, so he was thinking, yeah, he's in his bed, but he quickly started to realize he's Shit. on a mountain. There's a lot of ice around <laughs> yeah. here. So he started checking his limbs. His right arm, he said, sounded like wood when he banged it against the ground. Oh, barf. And you know it's completely numb. Oh my god, I can't even imagine. Oh god. Realizing the trouble that he was in, a burst of adrenaline kicked in. And he was able to uh, get up. God, the human spirit. Yeah. It's freaking... The desire to live on is (laughs) amazing to me. Um... I would have been like, I'm going back to bed. Yeah. <laughs> so then he stated, this was not bed. This was not a dream. This was real. And I'm starting to think I'm on the mountain, but I don't have a clue where. If I don't get up, if I don't stand, if I don't start thinking about where I am and how to get out of there, then this is going to be over very quickly. So well, That's absolutely true. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So he was able to gather himself up and make it down the mountain. As he stumbled his way into a different camp, the climbers were shocked to see (laughs) him because Beck's face was blackened from (gasps) frostbite. Oh, gosh. His limbs were never going to be the same as well. So he's... He's just been completely frozen over and is now like a robot man. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Once the doctor left uh, the two behind earlier, he contacted the loved ones. So Beck's wife and their teenage son received the call and the mourning process began for them. Oh, like they had received the call that he was dead. Yeah. He wasn't. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I wonder if she was regretting her divorce or was like, I fucking knew it. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully not. I'm sure she was regretting it and very sad. (laughs) Um, So within a few hours, base camp at the bottom were sending a helicopter to get him to the hospital. This was going to be the highest rescue mission ever completed. Because usually they don't retrieve the bodies. If they're that. If they're that high. Uh, but yeah. since he was alive and he yeah, probably could make it down. Mount Everest is littered with bodies. Just yeah. Just everywhere. I looked it up and there, as of 2019, there are over 300 people who've died on that oh, mountain. God. That's a lot. It is a lot. I don't know. Like, I, if I knew I was walking up and there's a dead body, I'd be like, that seems like a sign. Like, yeah, that's a bad let's open. turn it around. Yeah. And agreed. Ugh. I mean, they're, like, very physical, you know, like, they're, they're in great fit. shape. Yeah. And then if I'm like, I'm going to try. 
No. Well, I guess um, I, a friend of mine was telling me how she did a hike on Mount Hood, mm -hmm. and you have to be in pretty physically fit shape, and you have to prove that you've done so many hikes and done all this stuff. And so she went up, and in her group were a pair that were completely unprepared. Uh -huh. And they took them up anyway. And it ended up, they ended up having to turn around because they were so, they just brought the whole group down and it's like the whole time they were just waiting on them waiting on them and they were just not prepared and they right. shouldn't have been allowed to go on the hike at all well there's a lot of uh there's a lot of guided tours of mount everest and so pretty much they have these people uh they hire like this company and it's a guided thing and then they have people like set up their tents and do everything for them mm. pretty much i you know what i think i've seen i've read something about yeah. that or mm -hmm. yeah so and that's dangerous i mean you don't okay yeah Anyways. could you imagine going it's like just me rolling over to mount everest it'd be ridiculous <laughs> and unsafe for everybody <laughs> so once at the hospital Beck's right arm, nose, fingers on his left hand, and several pieces of his feet were amputated. Oh, yeah. The doctors were able to give him a new nose out of skin from his neck and ear where they grew it from his own forehead. What? Yeah. That's crazy. I know, right? Techn <laughs> Modern medicine. <laughs> Hard pass. Thank you. <laughs> you just have like a nose and Yeah, don't mind that. From... It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sad. <laughs> Sorry, back. <laughs> uh, he stated, they told me this trip was going to cost me an arm and a leg. So far. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> it fucking did. <laughs> well, he said, so far, I've gotten a little better. I've gotten a little better deal. Wrong, Beck. You did not. <laughs> yeah, I guess he didn't lose a leg. Just no, he an didn't. Arm and yeah. So. Once he got home, his wife and him stayed together. Oh, she wanted happy to take ending yeah. after all. She wanted to take care of him. Um, he did retire from climbing. I was gonna say probably because she knew he was never gonna climb again. Maybe so it was okay. Um, so he didn't complete the seven summits, but although he came back a little less physically whole, he claims that spiritually he's never been more together. Mm -hmm. Interesting. He states that. My guess is the sun warmed me up just enough that it triggered consciousness. Mm. Or maybe he suggests that that was going to be the day of my daughter's first date. The thing some fathers do to keep their daughter from going out with some grubby mitted boy. That's your fucking dad right there. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta break through this sheet of ice to keep Kaylin from dating anyone. <laughs> that sounds uh, right. Yeah, it does. <laughs> So Beck wrote, <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> uh, Beck wrote a book about this whole journey he had called Left for Dead, My Journey Home from Everest. More, it should be called Left for Dead twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. There is also a book written by someone else about him called Into Thin Air. And there's even a movie documentary called Everest and... Well, there's even a movie. Sorry, not a documentary. There's a movie called Everest. And Beck actually got to sit down with the writers and the actors, you know. Mm -hmm. And kind of go through it. Yeah. Uh -huh. I feel like I've seen a trailer for that movie. He said that in the beginning, he's portray like he thinks that he's portrayed as a jerk. But his wife's like, yeah, that's right. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's so. <laughs> so after months of healing... Uh, physically and emotionally, Beck went back to practicing medicine and also became an inspirational public speaker. Oh. Today, he is now 73 years old and living life. Living his best life? Yeah. Nice. So don't go to Mount Everest. <laughs> yeah, moral of the story. Don't well, climb mountains. There's also a huge line at the very top of it because everyone wants that picture at the very top. And there's so many people that said the weight could be 20 to an hour and a half and standing still for an hour and a half is very dangerous at the very top yeah, of the say, altitude oh my gosh so i don't know. like close enough snapped it let's right. go <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> so i don't know i it's a big accomplishment it's a big accomplishment but i don't know if it's worth it yeah i guess for some people it is yeah, worth it, it is. just i'm not that person they're like what adrenaline junkies like yeah. They like to, or they really want to accomplish something pretty Big, crazy. Yeah. Mm. Uh, 
Well, that's maybe a good segue okay. into Let's my story because he was yes. also trying to accomplish something Ooh. pretty remarkable that I would also have no part of. Okay. <laughs> So this is the story of an Italian man named Mauro Prosperi. And I apologize in advance if I completely (laughs) butchered that. I probably did. So in 1994, he signed up to participate in the Marathon des Sablis. That is my guess on how to say that. It's cute. Marathon of the Sand. Oh, okay. It's a marathon out in, it's an ultra marathon out in the Sahara Desert. That takes, it's essentially like six marathons all together. So Whoa. it's a 155 mile trek through the desert. That he's running? Yeah, you're oh running. Oh my gosh. I, know, I don't even know how you can fucking run in sand, let alone run six marathons worth of running in sand. Holy cow. Yeah, it's a yearly thing. They, I guess they raise a lot of money for some stuff. <laughs> I forget what it was. It was to help some kids or something. <laughs> something good? Yeah. No, good job, guys. I just don't remember what it is. Um, no, it's considered the toughest foot race yeah. on earth. So. Well, I, don't, I think people like pass out at the end of just regular marathons because yeah. their bodies are just so tired. Well, and now you're Being out sick. in... The desert, you know, with very little water, right. and you just got to go for it. Do they have rest stops? Like yes, there's a rest stop. There's like five or six checkpoints along the way, so you you stay, you, you spend the night, I see. and then you start again the okay. next morning. Okay, okay. So and your time is like taken once you hit the check mark. So then you can rest, and then your time starts again when you start. Going. Oh, that's so, really nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um. So he had, Morrow had a burning desire to join the race after a friend told him of this amazing marathon of the desert. Okay. And he knew he must be a part of it. And in spite of having to sign a form beforehand that declare where your body should be delivered after a worst case scenario. So Dang. So he had to sign a form to declare where your body should be delivered after a worst case scenario. Dang. I.e. Where should your dead body go? Right. Do they? So. Do you know if they have had death before? You know, good question. Yeah. I didn't look that up. That's okay. No. I was just wondering. We'll look up afterwards. Right. I would imagine so. I mean, if well, they... yeah, they had to put that in. I can <laughs> yeah. only imagine. It's like shit. We don't know where to send this guy. Let's yeah. put it in the form next year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> God. Well, <laughs> that warning did not deter our good Morrow. Okay. I think that's how you say his name. So, ignoring his wife's concerns, he began a training spree. This sounds like a common thing. Like, yeah. Listen to your wives, Listen I guess. Listen to your fucking wives, guys. <laughs> so, he started running 25 miles a day. Oh, my God. It's like, I used to walk three miles a day, mm-hmm. and I don't even know how I fucking manage that now. <laughs> it just seems like it's just so far. It's like a beautiful day, too. It's not like it's raining or I know. sand. Well, and you're not uh, reducing your water intake so you could get used to running with dehydration. Oh, my god! So he was methodically bringing down his water intake and all this stuff so he could get used to running in the Sahara Desert. It was just like the Witcher, the bathtub scene. <laughs> yeah. Dehydrate yourself to make your muscles look good. Mm. I'm just saying, Witcher. <sighs> I fucking love that show. I do too. And the video game. To you, okay. I know. <laughs> My God. Watch it. Netflix. No. I know. What is it on? Is it Netflix? Netflix, yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. It is super good. Okay. So before leaving for Morocco, he assured his wife that the worst thing that could happen is he'll come back with a little bit of sunburn. Really? Yeah, that was not the case. <laughs> <laughs> that was a white lie that turned into a big fat giant lie. Right. <laughs> So, he arrived in Morocco, and his first glimpse of the desert made him shiver with joy. Okay. So, he was instantly charmed by the beauty of the landscape. Aww. And so, at this point in 1994, there's 80 participants. Now, they're still doing the race, Uh and there's over 1,300. So, I think... I know. So, it's become pretty popular. popular. But I think the reason it was noted in the story is because it means that there was far fewer people to kind of keep an eye on each other. Oh. I mean, because now we're talking about 26 miles in between checkpoints. Right. And in one of them, it was like 91 kilometers, which is, I think, like maybe 60 miles. So if someone like fell or is having issues, there is always someone there to be like, oh, he needs help. Nowadays. Or something. Nowadays. But, but back, back in then, 1994, there's... no, you could okay. get quite a ways from people and not see anyone. Right. So, um, 
the race set off to a good start. So he was the first Italian to reach the first checkpoint, oh. and he checked into the next four and was in the top four. So wow. he was feeling really good, really upbeat. And so he decided on the on his way to the fifth checkpoint, he would leave a little early so he could keep his lead. Okay. And so uh, having a substantial head start on most of the participants, he wanted to secure a spot on the winner's platform. So he started off early and um, reached an area of the sand dunes prior to the fifth checkpoint. Okay. At the fifth checkpoint... Oh, no, this was an area... No, at the fifth checkpoint, he was supposed to receive fresh water and supplies. And oh, okay. So at every checkpoint, you sort of replenish all right. your supplies and then go on the next day. Sounds good. So he continued to venture out alone to kind of keep his lead. And he was surprised by a terrible sandstorm. Oh, so no. So this giant sandstorm. And I don't know if you've ever seen him, but yeah, there's just I like have. a wall of sand yeah. coming at you. So this sandstorm sparks up, and the grains of sand did a ton of damage to his skin and his <gasps> gear and everything. I mean, it's just, I mean, you're getting sandpapered, essentially. Right, because like, it's crazy. fast winds, too, huh? Yeah, it's high winds that are just, and you're just getting pelted. Wow. So he tried to continue on the race, and eventually he was like, I can't continue on. So yeah. he hunkered down. And turns out it took eight hours for the sandstorm to pass. Oh, my god! So he was kind of hunkered down. I'm assuming they all had sort of emergency shelters, you know, okay. that they could bring with them, right. like little tents or something. Okay. So somehow he found cover, made okay. it through the sandstorm. And uh, by the time it ended, it was dark. And he was pretty upset because he felt like he got pretty far off course, that the people are probably way ahead of him. Right. And, which I don't really understand just because they would have been, they would have been in the same yeah. sandstorm as he was. But he figured he could try to make up lost time. And okay. so he got up and continued on. Um, he decided that he had 36 hours more to complete the race uh -huh. before he was disqualified. And at this point, he just wanted to finish. Okay. So... He set off with high hopes. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. In the night. In the night. Wow. Um, so he was trekking alone and figured that as soon as he saw someone, he could team up with them and then they could finish the race together. Okay. So after running for four hours, uh -huh. uh, he realized he was lost. <gasps> and he had seen no one. He was way off course. He didn't realize where he was. And he immediately urinated into his water bottle oh I bet. <laughs> he was like i gotta get clean clear urine yeah as quickly as i can i guess his grandfather taught him this oh um because right. he had only a half a bottle of water left so he had two <gasps> bottles of water uh -huh. one was completely empty and the other one was half was half so he peed right away uh -huh. to save it and um kept on moving so the sandstorm kind of did it, were there markers for there this? There probably was, and, and then, then they were gone. Or blew yeah. away. Okay. Um, so he had a knife, a sleeping bag, a compass, a map, some dehydrated food, but only a half of a uh, bottle of water left. Okay. Uh, he would have, like I said, he would have gotten more. He would have been able to replenish all of his supplies once he hit that other checkpoint. Um, but fortunately, because of his training, all that tough training he did beforehand, uh -huh. he was actually faring pretty well. He had pretty dark skin, so okay. he wasn't getting super, a lot of sun damage. Oh, okay. Um, and he had a hat with him. Actually, he had two hats with him, so he always kept his head covered. And he only um, walked after dark and early in the morning and really just headed for cover during the middle of the day when right. it was just so, so hot. Okay. So, um... The next day, he heard a helicopter Ooh, and was all excited. Yay. So he rushed to use his flare that he had, but the helicopter was too low and didn't see his tiny little flare. So, too low? Yeah, I guess it was too low on the horizon. Oh, and so, so the dunes kind of... Yeah, so it just made it so he couldn't see the tiny little flare he had. Sad. So I guess now, the next year, they required much bigger flares. Okay. Oh, so it's not a flare carry. gun, it's just a flare. Yeah, it's I just see. a little flare that was the size of his thumb. Oh. And so I don't think it made it up really right. high anyway. Um, and it was like a super little lightweight flare. And right. that's why they used it because it was so light that you right. could carry it on your goddamn run that took forever through <laughs> yeah. the desert. 
<laughs> so the helicopter flew away Aww. and Morrow sank into despair. Oh no. So, he's not a beat no more. No, he is not a beat anymore. <laughs> So he trudged along for several days okay. until he came across a Muslim shrine dubbed Marabout. And I apologize if I screwed that up. I guess it was used as a shelter for people crossing the desert. Oh. It, there's a specific name for the people who cross it. It starts with a B and I... It's like it will use a shrine, you said? Yeah. It's okay. like it's a quick shelter oh, wow. as a stop and then they could move along. But this shelter was long abandoned. Oh. The only thing he found in it was a priest in a coffin. That oh, my gosh. Been dead a long time, you know, so he Oh, was, my God. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there was nothing. Just a um, body. Okay. Yeah, just this, just one priest. Um, just some tech guy. <laughs> okay. So he uh, decided to stay in the shrine for a bit. Um, he cooked his food using more urine, <laughs> so oh. water. Um he like the last of his water and fresh urine, the yeah. cleaner urine. I feel like I've talked about urine a lot. It's That's upsetting. Okay. Um, that had been gone for two days. Whoa. So now it's been like two days and he has had no water or anything. Um, so he climbed up to the top of the shrine and he planted the Italian flag up Aww. there in hopes that someone would go by and see. Uh -huh. And when he was climbing up, he found some bats. And so he immediately beheaded the bats, pulled out the intestines, and drank all their blood. And Holy fluids. shit! <laughs> Whoa! So he, while he was there, ate 20 something bats just raw because it was all there was. And yeah. it was the only way to get any fluids. <laughs> so That's crazy. He's yeah. hanging out in the shrine and thinking about his family the whole time. And in Italian law, I guess, he was a policeman back in Italy, um, the, a person has to be missing for 10 years before they're declared dead. Whoa. And so his wife would have not seen any of his pension or anything, lived without that income for 10 oh, plus whoa. years because essentially he's been lost in the desert. So you have to search for 10 years before. Oh my gosh, that's dead. a long time. So he decided he was going to do the best thing he could for his family and kill himself in, oh my gosh. in a place that he could be found. So if they find the shelter, they would find his body. He could be declared dead. His wife would get his pension. Uh -huh. and presumably they would, you know, live happily ever after. My gosh. Income. Um... So he wrote down his final words on a piece of paper using charcoal from his fire and slit his wrists and <gasps> laid down to go to sleep. But unfortunately, well, or fortunately, what? his blood was too thick from dehydration, dehydration <gasps> and it just clotted and oh he did not God. kill himself. So he wakes up the next morning and was like, fuck, but also right. like, this is a sign from God. I right. must move on. Wow. So he hears an airplane <gasps> and is super excited. Uh -huh. So he rushes to build the biggest fire he can uh -huh. and is like, he burned his backpack. He probably burned the flag. I don't know. And unfortunately, the plane didn't moved see him? on and no! did not see him. <laughs> and then almost immediately, another sandstorm comes oh, in. Oh my gosh. And so he hunkers down inside the shrine everything all his signals and everything that he had tried um to get attention were all covered over uh. <laughs> so he's just like fuck yeah <laughs> so he is once again just pure despair yeah like i can't even kill myself right I mean, like, can you fucking imagine wow so he loses all hope uh but after he woke up he decided it was time to... Oh, the sandstorm came in. Yeah. Came in that. before he tried to commit suicide. Sorry, I had those wrong. Oh. So he... The sandstorm, the airplane, all that happened, and then he tried to commit suicide oh, after I that because okay. he had lost all hope. So I apologize. Yeah, that's fine. I screwed that up a little bit. So he decided to voyage out into the desert okay. once more to try to find his way home. Um, he made a plan uh, based on what they had said... Uh, what they had instructed before the race began. And that was, if you're lost, head for the clouds that you can see on the horizon at dawn. That's where you'll find life. During the day, the clouds will disappear, but set your compass and carry on in that direction. 
So at dawn, he looked for clouds anywhere on the horizon. He saw some clouds, he set his compass, and he walked in that direction. That's the interesting. Inter- yeah, so if you're ever stuck in the Sahara, follow clouds. <laughs> okay. So, at dawn. Okay. And don't, <clears throat> don't deviate your course. Yeah. So feeling hopeful and restored, he continues walking through the desert for a few more days. He pretty much ate any snakes or lizards or anything that he could get his hands on right. and pretty much just ate them raw and right. drank their blood and fluids. Oh. You're welcome. On the eighth day, he reached a small oasis. <gasps> so he laid Yay. down and just slowly sipped the water. Oh, was it the... a mirage? No, it wasn't a mirage. <laughs> Thank God. Could you imagine? <laughs> he probably came across a few mirages sure. at that point. No, he laid down just next to the water and just slowly sipped the water for, you know, four hours or some such thing. And then feeling a little bit better, he kind of looked around and he saw a footprint, (gasps) a human footprint. So he knew humans were around somewhere. Okay. So looking around, he found, he eventually came across a herd of goats with a little girl right there. Oh, wow. And the little girl took one look at him and ran off screaming. I bet. I would too. <laughs> he was probably looking pretty rough yeah. at this point. Um, but fortunately, she did sound the alarm okay. in their little settlement to come and take a look at this freaky guy that yeah. just walked in. Um, so they ended up giving him some goat's milk, offered him shade until the police were called. Wow. And they found him. So he ended up going 181 miles off course. <gasps> so the beginning of the race is in Morocco. Uh-huh. He ended up in Algeria, like Whoa. the next country over. He had just wandered through the desert for 181 miles. He dropped 35 pounds, and so he was 99 pounds (gasps) when they found him. Oh, my gosh. He had minor injuries to his eyes and liver, I'm assuming just from dehydration and then all the sun. Um, And the recovery process took months. Um, And he only drank soups and other liquids for months and months. Oh, to try to get back to... I think just maybe that's all he wanted. I don't know, but that's just what it mentioned. Um, and four years later, he went back and completed the Marathon de Sable. Really? And he actually, went back? He ended up going back nine other times. Oh, my gosh. So he completed it a total of ten times after wow. that first attempt. That ended him. I would be done. <laughs> yeah, I would be done also. I guess he just fell in love with the desert. Interesting. Like, he... It just was... The climate he liked the he, best. Yeah, he loved it, and... I, uh, I would have been done, as yeah. you said. I guess now it's almost impossible for you to get lost on right, this. Okay. Um, but, you know, back in the day, it was a little more easier. Yeah. Right. How old was he? I think he was 39 or 40. That's crazy. So, yeah. Wow. He's not dead. Good job. He ate a lot of bats and a lot of and snakes. And... Yeah, I bet he's maybe done with meat for a long time. I, I probably bet. I be. guess, yeah. I guess, yeah, that would... <laughs> Put me off for a little while. Yeah, I've had too many snakes. Yeah. Sorry, Drink none for some me. Thanks. Soup. <laughs> wow. Just some clear broth, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, that was. Oh my gosh. Poor guy. I just was reading and was like, oh my god, he's gonna get saved. <gasps> no, no, he didn't get saved. Oh, he's gonna get saved. No, he didn't get saved. Yeah. What's well, a good story? I'm yeah. done with adventuring forever. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. No climbing, no running, long... I don't know. Yeah. I actually trained for a marathon. Did you? Forever ago, because I wanted to do the Disney marathon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got to the point where I could do 18 miles. And oh, my quit. God. Why? Because it was awful. Oh. <laughs> hated all of it okay yeah i had like shin splints all the time and i was just like this fucking sucks yeah we went out super early in the morning who uh amy and i oh wow. amy of wisconsin fame yeah. and we started i think we started at like six in the morning when it was still pretty cool out uh-huh. but by the time we got halfway done which was like 10 plus miles out um we decided it well it was super super hot and so we turned around and headed back and about I don't know, three quarters or more of the way back, we're like, we got to call our friend. Oh, <laughs> so really? Debbie of Alaska fame right. came and picked us up 
and we never went out again. Oh no. <laughs> that was the end of our marathon days. Well you they in Disney World they have different races well, like I for see different now. Yeah, I know I'm just saying like fucking half marathon or something. Yeah. Why didn't I sign well, up? Well you could for do that? a three K even too. Okay, don't I'm rub just, it in. I'm just saying like <laughs> you No, I'm just like now all these other no. things. I don't know back then, but now No, I think they did have all those shorter oh, did they? ones back then and I was there at Disney when they had those runs, and people were walking around the different medals, and I'm like, they look so cute. <laughs> they were so cute. I was so jealous. That's what I wanted. I right. That dream has died, though. I'm sorry. Now it's puzzles. It is puzzles. Disney puzzles. Yeah. I love puzzles. Oh. As do I. I don't care who makes fun of me. I love them. No, I love puzzles I love them forever. Well. Um, like they say on a Big Bang Theory, it's like having a thousand friends. Is that what they say? Yeah. That's funny. That's what Amy's mom says to her. <laughs> That's cute. I, I do love that puzzles. show too much, I think. All right. So <laughs> don't go to Mount Everest. I mean, I guess. No, don't the Sierra... go. <laughs> and don't go to the Sierra Desert. That one seems Sahara. more doable, I guess. I don't know. I Does it? I don't know. So you got super cold or super hot. <laughs> like... Which one would you pick? If you had to pick one, which uh, one would you pick? Super hot. I think I would too. Yeah. Because one, you're not climbing, and I mean, yeah, you're probably uncomfortable, but not like being frozen uncomfortable. Right. Like mm-hmm. when I get cold, I don't want to move. So forcing myself to like keep walking, I'll be like, nah. Yeah, hard pass. I just want to huddle. <laughs> like I don't want to move. Which... But like on sand, That's like true. running through sand, I can't even. Ugh, yeah, I can't, can't even imagine. Either both of them just sound bad, <laughs> but I would rather freeze to death than burn to death. Agreed. Right. Because then it just feels like you're warm and cozy in, in bed, a bed. Yeah. And like... your you know skin isn't bubbling up on your face. You right. Know. Ew. I guess oh. technically it could because we learned from frostbite. Yeah. Sad. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note. No, on that note, I might go take do a it. nap. For the yeah. Rest of the day. <laughs> take my hot take chocolate a, and go. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, it's good. All right. Well, then. um, All right. Well, if you enjoyed this podcast, then please follow us on Instagram and Facebook. I should totally be dead right now. And you can find all our episodes on our website as well at I should totally be dead right now dot com. And you can email us as well at I should totally be dead right now at gmail dot com. I feel like there's a theme. There's a theme. (laughs) There's a theme. And it's called I should totally be dead right now. That's right. So. But yeah, so thank you so much for listening, and we hope you enjoy it, and tune in um, every other Monday for a new episode. Woohoo! Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much. All right, bye. Bye. Bye.